You are live, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Russo. All right, Council, I'd like to call this committee of the whole meeting for April 13th, 2023 to order with adoption of the agenda. So I want to make that motion for me, please. Councilor Devlin, second by Councilor Palmer. All in favor? Motions carried. Uh, adoption of the minutes from the Committee of the Whole for March 16th. Someone want to make that motion for me? Councilor Cherry, seconded by Councilor Devlin. All in favor? Motions carried. Any business arising from those Committee of the Whole minutes? Seeing none, I'm just going to go on briefly to announcements. Uh, today, Cyclone Taylor Cup has started. Uh, exciting, got to uh, be part of the uh, initial uh, presentation and banquet last evening. Uh, great uh, group of hockey players to see four uh, teams all in the same room uh, with incredible integrity, uh, well-dressed as they always are, and uh, to be able to, to watch them at their age inhale as much food as they do is an awesome thing. So if anyone gets a chance to get out to the Cyclone Cup, by all means, um, go out, enjoy that. And uh, I understand Mr. Nato and Mr. Parliament are going to be there with the table talking about options for the arena as well. So people will be able to uh, engage regarding that. All right, we're going to move right on to staff reports, uh, public art in roundabouts. Uh, Mr. Mato, do you have a presentation or would like to speak to that? Sure, thank you, Your Worship. No formal presentation, just bringing forward a request from the Public Art Committee um, in regards to installing public art in some of our existing roundabouts. We've had several discussions at the public art level, public art committee level on this topic. And before a formal re resolution or recommendation comes forward to the council from this committee, I thought it would be prudent to have a more informal discussion with council on this topic and kind of just discuss whether or not this should be referred to the infrastructure and planning committee as there are some concerns with installing public art in roundabouts. Um, I know that it is commonly seen in other communities. There's no restrictions or there's no legislation that restricts public art in roundabouts. However, there are best practices for developing public art in roundabouts, and they are quite limiting to the type of public art that you can install in roundabouts. So I thought this warranted further discussion on that. Um, we do have the three existing roundabouts. We have Wright Street, Fourth Street, and the Nickel Road roundabout. And in a meeting that I had with Alyssa Becker, she is the roundabout trans roundabout engineer for, Me for McElhaney. Mm -hmm. So she did work on our existing roundabouts. And we had a conversation around the roundabouts and which would be suitable for public art if we did choose to go that route. And it was determined that the Wright Street roundabout could accommodate some form of public art if council thought that was appropriate. Um, the 4th Street roundabout becomes a bit more controversial. We did receive a grant from IB ICBC to make improvements in that area around safety. Um, so that would be problematic. And the Nickel Road roundabout is quite small to install a piece of art. So there's already a lot happening in terms of that intersection and what we can do there. So just wanting to have a discussion with council and maybe answer any questions or if Mr. Black wants to chime in on anything regarding roundabouts. And I know what he's going to say. He wants a statue of himself down there right here. <laughs> I'm not that vain, yes. <laughs> uh, so any suggestion for type of art? So I'm, I'm going to ask that question because, of course, we go into Sycamus and they've got their art in, in their roundabout and uh, it's, it's stunning to look at, but you can't see around it. You really have to pay attention to the going around it or maybe it's just the way I drive, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, so what are we thinking about is the best kind of art something that's low that we can see over or does it really matter? 
we haven't got into those details yet. I mean, you'll see all kinds of art all around the world. You'll see lots of public art in the roundabouts and they're huge. And while it's not not permitted, it's not encouraged from a safety perspective. So, you know, if we were to follow the parameters for designing public art in roundabouts, it would be somewhat limiting in terms of what we could do, but we could work with the public art committee to, to develop criteria that would reasonably satisfy some of those requirements. Sure. And then council we can problem. come back to council with that. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor Souls. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to weigh in a little bit. I was going to possibly not, but I think I'd like to weigh in a little bit. Um, the uh, my, in some anecdotal experience. So I remember going back a couple of decades, and actually our CAO might remember this, and and ticked in the baggage ha handler. So oh, yeah. it was Infamous. it was more a um, a traffic circle, so a tiny thing. So the baggage handler, for those that aren't aware, that was a a, a, a businessman, uh, a statue of a businessman in the, this uh, 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 traffic circle, um, in, carrying a briefcase. Uh, the notable thing is uh, he didn't have any clothes on. And so uh, he became a, a distraction in the community for sure. And uh, some parts were... Uh, stolen off of him <laughs> and uh, true, and repaired and stolen again uh, and ultimately he ended up uh, going to the uh, red rooster i think they maybe sold it since we went to the red rooster uh, winery uh, for uh, a more appropriate display i suppose um I, and i just relay that because i think it talks about the public art in places and there's an interest and i in general um, am very supportive of the idea of public art in uh, public spaces, and I applaud the the art community. I'm uh, also ha uh, having talked with uh, engineers over the years. We tend to be more um, uh, uh, generally generally a little bit less interested in art and more about the public safety or perceptions right. and engineering pr principles. And uh, sometimes I collide in in those zones. Um, in uh, Summerland, uh, again, overlap with uh, Mr. Parliament, uh, I was involved with uh, the roundabouts in that place. But more significantly, the Sycamus one, and this is where I learned quite a bit. So uh, I was interim CAO at the day when the, the concept of the, what you see outside of Sycamus was established. And that, that was a really fun exercise. It was essentially council of the day did the conceptual design. And, these, and they weren't they weren't art people they weren't art people but they did the conceptual sign and in uh notably there is you had the department of transportation basically that was their their facility ultimately and uh in uh, in my opinion and i think in sycamus's opinion it was very uh, uh foresighted of the department of highways to be open to things because they tend to be more engineer oriented and what one of the the key things for that particular one that i remember is one of the designs around roundabouts that i learned and i'm saying it from a lay perspective is you don't actually want to see through the roundabout because that's cars on the other side are a distraction right. so you should be seeing who's coming in and, and going ahead and so you actually don't want vehicles to see through and i think that's why we replaced uh uh less tasteful movable rocks uh, that we've had in the past. Um, I'm assuming they were forms of art and have trees in there. And that's that, that idea. So I, I, I think, you know, when you get into the safety or perceptions of safety, uh, it, you know, if, it, if it's a, a black and white safety thing, then, you know, you definitely don't want to do that. Uh, and, um, and if we want the ultimate safe road it's one where you don't have vehicles on that's the ultimate safe uh, place but how how this can be done and if uh, so i'm just saying that i'm very uh, favorable towards and it, it takes a little bit of sort of understanding the parameters and if we go down that route we may need somebody with expertise on um, on roundabout intern internal design um, and when we look at the fourth street one uh 
the um, uh, you know there's been some criticisms uh, on the uh, the location of the the, the, the road going or, or, or so the cycle path going across it's not may not be ideal and um, so anyways those I just wanted to sort of relay those comments so that we don't sort of shut it down on the safety card too too rapidly so that's my my perspective any other comments from council yes sir Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mayor Schultz. I just want to say that I, I spent uh, a considerable amount of time growing up in Washington, D.C., which was originally designed by uh, an architect by the name of Pierre Lafont. Um, what some of you guys probably don't know is, is Washington, D.C. has got traffic circles all over the place. It's got in and out of traffic circles that are, you know, um, separated by curbs. They've got, you know, pedestrian crosswalks that are controlled by traffic signals. It was quite the place to learn how to drive with all those traffic circles. That being said, you know, a lot of those traffic circles, I mean, some of them had parks in the middle of them, they had statues. Um, so I think there is uh, the possibility of having art in traffic circles, but I think safety has to be paramount at the forefront of our uh, decision-making process. Um, that being said, you know, if moving forward, we're, we're looking at traffic circles and we're looking to implement more of them, you know, maybe we want to have that element in mind um, when we design these structures. So, so. Any other comments? Uh, thank you, Marshall. Um, I kind of have to agree with uh, Mr. Stapenhurst. Um, when we're talking about public art in the right roundabout, um, it seems like it's coming to the table too late and we'll be spending more money um, consulting around safety. And it might put um, too many restrictions on the art that's ending up in the roundabout. Um, it also won't be accessible to people that aren't in vehicles. Um, I think it would be something to consider with um, the development of different roundabouts, but I don't know if I would support public art in that roundabout at this time. And that's one on Wright Street? Yes. Did you come in? Okay. All right, Councilor Orlando. Um, Your Worship, just a question. Um, did the art group, uh, the committee, have something in mind that they were hoping to do? Mr. Long? No specific art project, just mm -hmm. some form of art, mm -hmm. um, just to improve the aesthetic quality of the existing roundabouts. It's a lot easier to incorporate public art at the onset of the roundabout design than mm -hmm. after the fact. Right. Um, a lot of the safety elements could be easily addressed during the design phase. Um, something that hadn't been considered when these original roundabouts were created, but perhaps moving forward, that is something that we can start having a conversation around mm -hmm. um, if we do design other roundabouts. And so we've got some landscaping in all of the roundabouts now, so landscaping would probably have to be altered or moved. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Mr. Parliament. Thank you. So. Echoing Councillor Palmer's comments about the Sycamus roundabout, which I had the privilege to, I guess, finish the project and have detailed discussions with MOTI, ICBC, McElhaney led the consulting team working with First Nations because embedded in that artwork is a story of Splash Scene and the Sewapnik, and you can see the language. And we went through all these discussions and basically uh, echoing Councillor Palmer's concern, having gone through it, let's start the conversation with those key stakeholders. The difference was that roundabout in Sycamus was an MOTI project. It connects 97 to Highway 1, um, whereas what we're talking about here is a municipal project. It's not part of the major provincial transportation system. But we went through the same discussions and we had concerns about safety and, and public art. And in the end, we were able to find a compromise. And um, luckily, um, we have the same consultant working here and uh, we had a great relationship with McElhaney and we came up with what we thought was it was a good compromise. In addition to the public art, you see the lighting and the lighting was also a challenge because that does distract drivers. There's a camera above that um, uh, roundabout that you can go on the district webpage and if you have nothing better to do, you can watch the traffic. It's 24 seven. And it's amazing over time how the locals just get used to it. They don't look at the dart anywhere. They just follow the road and it's almost forgotten. Um, so I've gone through this and it starts with the conversation, get everyone in the room. I do believe there is a compromise there where you can have both, you can have safety and you can have something really cool. Good.
So um, I guess, Mr. Nano, when we talk about that, are you okay with engaging with uh, uh, the art group and seeing what their proposal is? They brought it to you, is that correct? And that's correct. And sure. then just have that conversation with Matt Mulhaney and see what they say and go from there. Mm -hmm. See uh, how that transpires, I guess. That's my question to you. Yes, that would be fine, Your Worship. I'm not sure if there's an appetite to forward this to the infrastructure and planning committee. Do you want to talk about that further, Tim, uh, to PIC? Uh, you know, I think it's at the sort of conceptual, um, I, not. I, it'd be fine. Uh, it'd be fine for it to come to the committee. Um, the you know some of the thoughts that I'm having right now is sort of just sidestepping that for a moment. I'm just wondering if there's ways that the art community can integrate the landscaping components design and create essentially natural natural art so that it's uh, meeting the design guidelines of uh, roundabouts. Uh, from a landscaping perspective, but is artistically done. Just a thought, but uh, I'm not sure if the uh, infrastructure committee would really have very much more to weigh, weigh in. Really. Okay, so if we said that, Mr. Nano, Mr. Black, do you want to weigh in before I... Uh... Please, Your Worship. Um, I would just request that uh, prior to approval of any art project, that engineering has the last chance to look at the project on it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, and I think all of us would be comfortable with that. So if we can leave it with you. A couple of the items, a couple of the big items that are outlined in the housing action plan. We're really pleased with where we've gotten to at this point with a lot of internal and external community engagement. And we want to present these policies to council for initial consideration, uh, or sorry, to committee for consideration. feedback. Any questions that you guys have, please let us know. And we'll do our best to answer them and then subsequently we'll be looking at bringing these forward to council for formal adoption so we can get this process rolling asap so with that we'll go over to mr thompson who should be online yes mr thompson we'll leave it in your hands thank you thank you very much uh mayor and council i just have a very brief <coughs> powerpoint to share here um that will walk you through some of the high level uh elements of the the two policies which are intended to work side by side um I will just preface this as, uh, can I see, can everybody see the, the PowerPoint now? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, so I just preface this, that uh, uh, this, this work, um, you know, in terms of what we're going to be, be walking you through today, uh, just provide a really brief background, making the link between the housing action plan that was, that was uh, received by council last year and these two policy pieces with, with room for discussion and questions on each of them separately. And, and of course, room at the end for further discussion uh, as necessary. Um, but uh, just, you know, wanting to provide this, this piece of background um, that these two policies represent a really important foundational component of, of housing work in Revelstoke. Um, they were identified as uh, two of the three foundational actions that will support the, the overall strategies uh, of the action plan. Um, so the first is to, the, the fir first of the three actions is, is to develop a, a suitable community amenity contribution or, or cash in lieu program that essentially allows for developers and uh, at all scales to provide cash contributions to an affordable housing reserve. So that, that piece of work is still uh, in the hands of staff, but in order to facilitate it, um, the, the city has wanted to take a look at these other two pieces, which are really about uh, kind of jump-starting processes that were already in place informally in the city and formalizing them so that there's a, a clear uh, transparent and, and easy to access process for, for nonprofits looking at developing affordable housing in, in Revelstoke. Uh, and the first is to develop a, a clear policy that outlines what an affordable housing reserve can be used for and how to use the online accommodation platform funds. And the second is, is about how to access city lands. Um, and so these are, these are two key pieces in that they provide, uh, the foundations for for nonprofits that are looking at projects or, or in concept development phase uh, to really move forward uh, with projects in a way that the city can support them, where policies and processes are clear. And one of the underlining uh, uh, sort of elements of this has been to make it um, a non burdensome, non onerous process for nonprofits. We recognize that they tend to have limited capacity, largely operate with uh, volunteer boards in place and are, and are you know, trying to do uh, really important work in the community. And so this process is intended to, 
uh, to provide access to the, the municipal commitments around housing in a way that, that is easy uh, for, for nonprofits, but provides the right levels of due diligence at the right, the right stages of the process uh, to, to minimize risk to the municipality and to ensure that, that all partners are, are working towards achieving goals collectively. Um, so the first uh, policy I'll be talking about is the Affordable Housing Reserve Policy uh, with an online accommodation platform fund. Um, so we've combined these two. There, there's a lot of uh, parallel between what an affordable housing reserve fund is typically used for in a municipality and, and the outlined uh, requirements around OAP funds. Uh, and so we built them into one, one policy with the recognition that they may need to, to occupy different actual uh, uh, sort of bank accounts or funds from a financial uh, perspective. But <clears throat> essentially the the objective of uh, these, this, this policy is to address the effects of the housing crisis by, by working towards um, uh, the, the two elements or the two strategic directions of the, of the housing action plan, which is to support residents who are, who are vulnerable and experiencing housing barriers and to increase the supply of affordable housing and workforce housing, uh, largely rental, although at the discretion of council, uh, other forms of housing can also be considered as, it, as it's outlined in the policy. Um, so what does that mean uh, in a practical sense? It means that, that the focus is on uh, land or, or unit acquisition, if there are units available, um, contributions to improve existing conditions to, uh, to affordable housing, uh, to offset city development cost charges, particularly DCCs, um, which municipalities have the opportunity to, to reduce um, but of course, that that infrastructure spending has to come from somewhere, uh, and so often municipalities will use the affordable housing reserve to to waive the DCC uh, DCC requirement for affordable projects, but then uh, take those funds from the affordable housing reserve as a contribution uh, to the project, and and then of other forms of of grant supports. Um, <clears throat> So OAP funding, uh, quite similarly, is, is focused on acquiring, constructing, maintaining, or renovating uh, housing or shelter or land used for housing or shelter, um, and then supporting housing, rental, or shelter programs. Uh, so combining those two, two kind of uh, high-level uh, directions, um, there are a few elements that this, this policy is really looking at, um, and they could be broken into kind of two two types of applications. The first is um, for nonprofits that are that are very early on in their planning phase uh, that may have no uh, no no even sort of concept plan but know that they would like to act uh, or develop a project. Um, and this is this is a, a sort of grant component, a one-time contribution from the affordable housing reserve of up to ten thousand dollars of funding. Uh, for an application to allow uh, to allow projects or nonprofits to move ahead, even when they're at the very, very early sort of kernel or seed ideas of an application. Um, and what this allows them to do is it, it can be leveraged against senior government funding. Um, so when you're applying to CMHC, for example, for seed funding, uh, having a, a contribution even of a few thousand dollars from your local government shows support of that local government. Uh, and it, it strengthen, strengthens the, the nature of that application. Um, and it also allows them to, to maybe do, you know, some of the preliminary planning pieces, those feasibility pieces, um, ranging from site assessment to early site design uh, in, a, in a cost effective way. And again, that can contribute to when that work is done, it can contribute to the strength of a seed funding application. So that's, that's kind of one well delineated piece of the policy. Uh, these are they're, they're intended to be, again, one time uh, concept development uh, grants to a maximum of $10,000. Um, and then the majority of the policy focuses on uh, projects that are maybe a little bit further along um, and that are, you know, uh, either in the process of a, a, also a seed funding, but maybe having done more of their due diligence. Maybe they have an understanding of what their unit and rent structure is going to look like, but they need, uh, you know, they need a, a pro forma developed or a feasibility, uh, a feasibility program or feasibility study undertaken. Um, and uh, the 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 affordable housing reserve uh, grants can then kind of move towards uh, not supporting that work directly, but instead supporting the the 
uh, either the DCC waivers or the acquisition, construction, or renovation of affordable housing. And again, um, the way that the, the policy is structured is we, we've structured it to uh, essentially um, su support or strengthen nonprofits that are going through various applications and their applications to senior government can be staged, staged in a, a range of different ways from early seed funding uh, all the way through to, to project development funds uh, to BC housing, all the way through to, to capital fund applications through things like the community housing fund. And so the affordable housing reserve is intended to, um, uh, or the policy is intended to support nonprofits that are at any of those stages of funding uh, by stepping up and, and showing that there's a matching commitment of funds from local government. But in, in this case, really uh, kind of directly tied to the, the, the construction or the development or the, the making of the units, the bricks and mortar piece. Um, and that can be anything from, again, uh, supporting the development side of things through a, a DCC waiver or just a direct grant uh, that supports the construction of, of the units. So <clears throat> some other key elements of this policy is that it's intended to, uh, to move fairly quickly with a, a time period of sort of a, a 30 day cal 30 calendar day response period from the city um, when a successful application is made um, and mayor and council uh, approve it. Um, the funding is generally intended to be a one-time non-renewable capital grant with the exception of that early concept development that has a maximum limit of $10,000. And, uh, and of course, the city of Revelstoke is under no uh, obligation to spend all of the available funding in any given year. Um, funds can roll over from year to year uh, with this policy in place. And so if a good application comes in one year uh, and may be eligible for, for a larger piece, uh, funding those funds would be available, or if they're they're kind of uh, distributed out over a number of years, uh, the policy allows for both approaches. Um, so I, I will was planning to pause there for some discussion on this piece uh, before we move into the land disposition uh, discussion. Any comments, Council? Any questions or concerns? Councilor Orlando. Um, Your Worship, uh, uh, a question uh, regarding uh, maybe the last point on capital funding. Uh, one of the challenges uh, for nonprofits developing uh, housing is uh, having an available capital pool. Essentially, they don't have one and they rely on uh, big federal and provincial grants. So within the policy, is there an opportunity to um, assist them in uh, acquiring or building a capital pool. Uh, so, for example, would the policy say if we give you, you know, a hundred thousand or a million, whatever, for something, you must spend it uh, soon and be back at zero? So, I'm just wondering how that, uh, what thoughts are on uh, assisting nonprofits in developing a renewable. Uh, uh, capital pool and you know as an observation in the private market people don't really develop uh, much in the way of uh, rental housing anymore it's economically uh, you know uh, you want to develop a condo and sell it um, and uh, sort of having nonprofits operate in building rentals only without being able to um, get their capital back after selling it puts them at a sort of natural disadvantage. I understand that's what they're in the doing in the you know largely in the business of doing and developing rentals, uh, which is much needed. But it's like catch twenty two there. So just gathering some thoughts on that. Comment, Mr. Thompson. Uh, I'll respond to the the first question in terms of uh, helping to develop a uh, sort of capital pool. This this policy is really intended. To, to provide direct capital support for specific projects and specific builds uh, and, is, and is therefore tailored around kind of best practices for affordable housing reserves and affordable housing reserve funds from communities around BC. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think it's a, a good point that's made. It, it, nonprofits do have a challenge in building up their, uh, their capital, their capital uh, funding pool. However, because, uh, because of the limited nature of, of local government funds typically available through a, through a reserve fund, um, this is kind of targeted to be, to be uh, leveraged towards specific projects when a, when a nonprofit has a concept or a project that it wants to bring forward. I would suggest that um, uh, when it comes to kind of the viability and the sustainability of nonprofits long-term, 
while there may be a role for the municipality to be to, to play, and it may, may even be a strong one um, in the case of a housing authority or something, that, that that really should be considered in the overall kind of viability and operation of a nonprofit. And, and the reserve fund is intended to kind of be very project specific and very project focused to, to kind of see achievable and tangible um, uh, uh, gains in affordable housing in a given community. And the, the reality is, is that given the, the cost of construction these days, um, you know, often affordable housing reserve funds are a, a fraction of the actual capital that's needed. And so access, access to those senior government dollars are typically required. And, and what the, the reserve fund does is it allows the municipality to, to step in and show support and to, to provide some key contributions to, to uh, specific elements of a project, uh, for example, a DCC waiver uh, or something along those lines. Um, so I think I think it's a, an excellent uh, consideration around the sustainability of our nonprofit sector, but may maybe part of a larger discussion. Uh, although I'm not sure if Mr. Simon has any further thoughts. Thank you, Worship, if I may, and just to break this down to put these policies in their most simplistic manner, the whole intent behind both this policy and the subsequent land disposition policy that will be discussed is. Nonprofits, whether it's just them or in partnership with the developer, they have an affordable housing project in mind. They want to apply for city funds and they want to apply for city lands. Very low barrier to entry. Fill out a very basic application. Give us your thoughts on your on your concept. We'll bring it forward to council. And within 30 days of an application, you will get a non-binding letter of intent signed by the city saying we will support this project with $100,000 of affordable housing reserve funds going towards the project and this piece of property. Go to senior level of government and get the support from them, BC Housing, CMHC, whoever it may be. And you already right off the bat show that within 30 days of this idea coming to fruition, you have support from the local government. So it's all about low barrier to entry to these projects. And I think a really good tangible example is the 24 unit apartment complex on Humber. You can talk to the housing society and some of the challenges and the uncertainty in the process at the beginning. These costs of DCCs, and we gave them a 50% waiver, and then there's utility costs. This would ax all of that conversation, and it would give them a very clear avenue of how to get their proposal in front of council, and have council be that final decision maker to say, yes, we support the project, go to the next level of government and get the support. That's real, the nitty gritty intent of these policies. Thank you for that follow up, Councillor. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, everyone, for, for the responses. Just a quick follow up question. This is uh, very detail uh, oriented on the first point. It mentioned a $10,000 cap for initial development uh, funding. Um, I, I believe, and I don't have it off the top of our head, but our initial costs for contractors who are doing design and build or design uh, components of uh, the existing project is more than that. And I'm wondering why the, the cap at uh, 10,000 was decided at. Yeah, I, I will speak to that. Mr. Simon, if you want to jump in. Um, the reason we selected that is because the, the, there are other funds available out there to do early concept development work. The primary one being CMHC's seed funding application. Uh, and with the seed funding application, nonprofits are eligible for up to $50,000 in grants and up to $200,000 in forgivable loans, depending on the size and scale of a project. So there's a very well-defined senior government uh, avenue for, for accessing funds that will support a lot of that, uh, of that early work. This, in this case, um, you know, the, the $10,000 cap is intended because there is a risk that multiple applications could come forward um, for various projects and easily draw down uh, the affordable housing reserve on concept development work alone. Um, it's maybe not likely to be a, a risk in the next year if there are only a couple of nonprofits operating, but in a conducive, an environment that's conducive to nonprofit housing development, you see, you may see that interest grow over time. Uh, and and this is a, it's essentially designed as a cap to protect the majority of the, the affordable housing reserve from just being drawn down by, by concept development work that is very well funded uh, through other avenues. But at the same time, we understand the value that a small contribution from local government can make toward a seed funding application as it shows a uh, willingness to partner and an interest from, from the municipality's perspective to see a project move forward. 
Um, and so that small grant can be used to leverage larger amounts of senior government funding uh, through seed funding. Uh, another one that can sometimes come up is, is BC Housing's project development funding as well. So it shows that small amount of matching funds and it's really intended to be kind of a leveraging point and, and to some extent to protect the reserve from, from kind of overly being drawn down by concept development alone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you Mayor um, In regards to this policy, um, we keep talking about affordable housing. Um, if there's nonprofits coming forward with a social housing project or an emergency shelter project, are they still able to ex access these funds? Yes. Uh, yes. The, the the part of the focus um, that support the under under part two of the policy where we look at supporting residents who are experiencing housing barriers uh, uh, and increasing the supply of workforce in that we're covering essentially um, most of the left hand side of the housing continuum from kind of emergency housing to uh, to housing with supports all the way through to kind of um, affordable, social, all the way to low end of market housing. And, and in fact, we anticipate that some projects may be, may be mixed and we may see some a market component of some and others we may see focused uh, entirely on kind of supporting um, uh, populations that need vulnerable or that need multiple different kinds of supports. So there, there is intended to be a range of options that are out there uh, and really, really focused on the, the kind of, again, the first two strategic directions in, in the housing action plan. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Simon, any follow-up? Uh, through your worship, the only comment I would have as a follow-up to that is there's a very uh, specific reason why these are council policies and not bylaws. So them being council policies, if there is a very good concept that council wants to see move forward, the policy is high-level direction on, you know, maybe for staff to say, here's how we are going to administer the process. If there is something that falls a little bit outside the lines of the actual text within the policy that council still wants to see move forward, that is completely within the purview and at the discretion of council. So this doesn't put you into a box to say you must do X, Y, and Z. It says, generally speaking, here's how we want to use these funds and here's what we want municipal land to go towards with respect to affordable housing. But certainly don't think that if there's a really good idea out there, that uh, it won't be something that staff will bring forward or won't bring forward for council consideration. And so we shall follow? Uh, no, thank you very much. Great. Any other comments or questions from council? Any uh, anything further, Mr. Thompson? Uh, just to walk through, if we've got a few more slides for the next policy, which is the land disposition policy. Um, so this is intended again to work alongside of uh, alongside of the affordable housing reserve fund. We do we always know that that land is one of the major barriers to the development of affordable housing, and it's one of the most important things that local governments can bring forward as a partner in the process uh, of developing it. Um, BC Housing and CMHC. Well, CMHC's seed uh, funding actually requires that a site be identified and a partnership be undertaken, even if a, a sort of lease agreement or sale agreement hasn't been signed, that there's an indication in good faith that the city is a partner. Um, that's required to access seed funding, uh, that, that site control over a land. And so we, we also um, uh, understand that, that uh, there are some great opportunities right now in the city of Revelstoke to, to look at. Um, land disposition for the purposes of affordable housing. Uh, and so with, with the, the groundwork that's been laid uh, through, the, through the city's um, land use inventory uh, that looks at cent supporting centralized development, encouraging uh, infill development and increasing the supply of missing middle, um, uh, the, the, the land use inventory did not necessarily explicitly identify strategies for achieving these units. And so <clears throat> part of the the, the main purpose of this policy is, again, to provide uh, guidance and a low barrier process to organizations who want to access municipal lands uh, for the purposes of building affordable housing. And again, here, affordable housing being, uh, you know, largely on the, the left hand side of the, the housing continuum, but all the way up to, um, uh, you know, a mixed income rental where there may be some market component rent of rental with more affordable rental. Uh, and the, the way that the policy is designed is uh, it focuses on those things, but as Mr. Simon just mentioned, um, there's st still clear uh, council ability to, to identify uh, projects that are outside of the, the scope that's immediately defined within the policy and, and move ahead with land disposition if there's a promising 
uh, project or an innovative project that kind of doesn't fit the normal boxes that are that are identified through the policy. Um, so this policy is intended to provide uh, a direct link to the land inventory, um, and it's it's you know essentially says that that annually uh, the city will will identify a set number of parcels, I and I believe. Uh, Mr. Simon, that, that we are at two now in the way that the policy uh, is written. We've changed it from three to two, uh, two pieces of land available for disposition that are identified on an annual basis and that can be brought forward for applications for, uh, for an affordable housing development. Um, and the way that we've structured the application process, uh, and there is a, there's a, a use guide for nonprofits that goes alongside of both these policies, but uh, again, is to um, is to, to keep the early application low barrier and not onerous, but also recognize that the further along a project gets, the more certainty uh, and the more due diligence needs to be, needs to be undertaken um, from the municipal perspective. So stage one, when, munis when nonprofits are accessing you know, an initial funding, um, it would be a simple letter of agreement, uh, for example, that the municipality is, is uh, willing to, to use one of their sites to uh, be part of a seed funding application. Um, but then as projects move forward, as their viability is proven, as there's greater interest either from you know, CMHC through their programs or BC Housing through their programs, um, as, as uh, nonprofits move towards applying to you know, higher tiers of funding to, to do more serious pre-development work, uh, that then the due diligence and the commitment uh, but also the the risk protection from the city uh, grows, and so there's a you know a stronger commitment of land, but also more is asked of the nonprofit uh, until finally you know full funding and development begins uh, at stage three. Then uh, uh, that would be the the sort of finalization of a lease agreement uh, for the disposition of the municipal lands um, once all the kind of appropriate fundings and agreements are in place with with an organization like BC Housing or CMHC. So really intended to be a staged process so that it's a low barrier to entry, but as a project moves along, uh, sort of getting commitment from senior government uh, through its pre-development stages, that so too um, does the, the sort of uh, commitment and the ask from the city to the nonprofit about information uh, about their project kind of grow. And so, so it's intended to be a process that, that moves along the development path with nonprofits uh, and kind of ramps up what it asks of them uh, as we go along. So it's not it's not an, a big onerous. You have to come to us with a fully fleshed out project before we'll even consider it. Which is how how some municipalities certainly structure their uh, their land disposition. Um, so in terms of the applications, uh, they will be they uh, will be accepted at any times. But of course, dependent on the available municipal lands. And again. Uh, Staff are, are aiming for a 30, uh, 30 calendar day turnaround um, once council considers a successful application. Uh, and again, that would be sort of a letter of commitment style uh, uh, response. And, uh, and that's, that's it for sort of the presentation today, but I think there's probably more questions. Uh, so happy to answer any questions that come to mind. So council, any questions uh, regarding the Tom Thompson's uh, yeah, thank you, uh, I was just wondering why um, they, we chose two uh, parcels of land uh, per year to be released for affordable housing. Uh, Mr. Simon, comment on that. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Lucio, um, certainly the conversation on the comprehensive land inventory will be a, a subsequent conversation and Council will see how it's structured. Um, certainly you can include more than two. What we want to do is make sure that we're not overwhelming anyone who's looking through a catalog of potential properties to see a list of 70 properties that they may have access to. I will say just because two are identified does not negate the ability for a proposal on any other property to come forward before council. It's what the city is saying. These are two properties that we think are most suitable for affordable housing development. And again, this still needs to be approved by council. So council will have the final say on how many properties we, we convey to the community are suitable for nonprofit housing development. But it, we want to make sure that we're focused in terms of the properties that are most suitable. And council will see as we delve into the land inventory at a later date. Uh, we don't have as many properties that are suitable for housing development as, as one may think. Right. Good. Follow up, council? 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so when they're putting in that initial um, application, are they coming forward with land they want to use, or are you guys directing them to a parcel of land that their project would work best on? Uh, through your worship, the way we envision this, and it will vary depending on the sophistication of the proponent as they're coming forward. Some of them will have a lot of experience in the field, some of them won't have that much experience. So that will depend on the level of engagement that staff need to have at the onset of the application process. But generally speaking, it will be at the request of the nonprofit as to what is most suitable for their project and any insight that staff can provide at that time to make sure that we don't have nonprofits that are going down the wrong path right at the beginning and that they're selecting a parcel that is most suitable for their project. And more importantly, most suitable for the needs of the community will be a big conversation um, as part of that application review before it's brought to council. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Thompson? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Simon, you have further comment? Uh, dear your worship, just all of council, just one thing. I know sometimes we see these policies come forward and you're like, oh, great, another policy, and the planners love their policy, and it can be super dry, and it doesn't seem like it's much. But I do want to say to council and to the community that these two policies to say how we support financially and how we formally dispose of land for these important projects in conjunction with the comprehensive land inventory are, are game changers. We have inquiries constantly about we want to develop affordable housing or a project that has a mix of affordable and market rental housing. How do we make it happen? And when the answer from staff is, well, we don't really have a process right now and you can make a request to council, but it's not formalized, that is a deterrent for many. So sure. formalizing this process, and again, I know it seems like not much, but it's just policies on paper. This is a very, very big, crucial step for the city to take, in my opinion, as to actually supporting affordable housing development within the community. So I don't want that to be lost with this process. Because the policies can get a little bit dry and technical at times, and we certainly appreciate that. Appreciate uh, your worship, just one follow-up question. So um, if my understanding is this is uh, uh, limited to nonprofit, uh, nonprofits accessing this funding. Um, and I was wondering if there is an example of, uh, for example, a mixed market thing and how, uh, like, uh, how the nonprofits would access that and uh, what the nature of those nonprofits are. Through your worship, and Mr. Thompson can add in anything that I missed. While the policies are generally geared towards nonprofit, you'll notice in them there are some opt out clauses that are specifically at council discretion. There is some great financing from senior levels of government. CMHC has great mortgage financing, it will be 40 year mortgages for rental <laughs> that achieve uh, affordability over the long term. And we don't want to negate the ability to support projects like that within the community, but we want to make sure that it's providing affordability in perpetuity. So with those projects where there is a mix of market and not market that would come forward, what you would probably see is a pretty strict housing agreement recommendation from staff so that the affordability measures that are required through things like CMHC financing are provided in perpetuity for the project. So it doesn't negate the ability of a for-profit developer to make an application, um, but their project has to demonstrate at a very high level if it's going to get city support, affordability is achieved in perpetuity. And one of the things that we need to be cognizant of is the city can't support private business unless we're getting something in return that is of equal value. So that affordability component and it being achieved over the long term if the city is going to dispose land for a mix of market and non-market housing needs to be demonstrated and it needs to be um, very, very solid for the lifespan of the building. Um, yeah, just a quick follow up. And um, again, um, in those, you know, what my concern, just to state it up front, is um, uh, uh, over com competition uh, uh, for a limited pool of capital funding. Um, I think, uh, for example, Revelstoke Community Housing Society is in a good position uh, with a, a solid social focus and a track record of results in developing uh, housing. Um, but my concern would be, uh, um, over, yeah, too much competition for a limited pool of funding uh, and tapping it down. So I guess uh, my question is this, is that, um, as this is a council policy, a policy of the city, would uh, these applications, uh, if they came from, from a private developer, uh, would they be require council approval? Uh, would, it, would it be clear on what they're doing? Would, uh, is there any opportunity 
for the developer to uh, uh, bypass council and just uh, seek, seek staff approval. Uh, and really what I'm driving at is I don't want to be surprised to find out that all of this funding that we've saved for nonprofit housing has somewhere been uh, channeled somewhere else that we didn't know about. So if, if you could address those questions to the chair, thank you. Yeah. Through your worship, council approval required for any dispositional land as well as any funding. And that is a really crucial piece of this policy. and. As we move forward, who knows how the city will evolve? There's discussions about housing authority, and maybe council wants a housing authority to manage some of that. Mm -hmm. Those are conversations certainly for a later date. And it's important to note these policies were drafted intentionally to be adaptable so that they can mesh with a future model that the that city and council may contemplate. But 100 percent these all these applications that come forward, and that is the key within 30 days, staff will present it to council. Council is the final decision maker, and by no means is council obligated. To support every application that comes forward, even if it complies with the policy, it is purely council's discretion whether or not to support a project and whether or not to support them financially or with land disposition. And if someone comes forward and says we want hundred thousand dollars of OED funding for this project, and council says, you know what, hundred thousand is too much. You haven't demonstrated that you need it. We'll give you twenty thousand or fifty thousand, totally within the purview of council. Um, Mr. Thompson, have I have I missed anything there? No, I think you've I think you've hit on all the key points. Okay. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Appreciate your time and uh, your work on this. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. So to your worship, um, just a quick overview. We're not looking for any specific resolution from the committee today, um, but we will be finalizing these policies. We did get legal review back with some very minor and consequential changes um, before it's brought back for council consideration. And we will need to formally establish it needs to be a bylaw, and Ms. Moore, correct me if I'm wrong, for the affordable housing reserve which is a really crucial piece of this. So we'll be working on that in the background, but today, critically, if there's any feedback from council before the final policies are presented for council consideration, um, we would certainly appreciate that so we can make any tweaks or changes uh, as per direction from council. Okay. Any concerns, council, on what, I, on what I'm seeing uh, looks great because it gives council the ultimate uh, decision-making power. Uh, thank you, Marshalls. Um, just in respect to any applications that are mixed affordable and market housing, um, is there a ratio of what would be can have to be affordable housing versus what would be market housing in this policy? Uh, through your worship, it doesn't have a specific ratio in there. There's there's targets for what constitutes an affordable housing unit. Um, but this is something where it would certainly be a conversation with staff prior to bringing it to council. And if we have a proposal where 5% of the units are affordable. You certainly won't be seeing staff recommend support of it. It needs to be meaningful proposals. And the only idea behind the mix of market and non-market, it's not intended to make a profit. It's intended to make the projects viable. And what you're seeing in those of you that have worked with the housing society is that it is challenging when it's pure non-market housing to make these projects sustainable over the long term, financially speaking. So it's really intended to open up those opportunities, but a major portion of the, develop, the development would still need to be non-market housing if it's going to get support from the city. The city is not interested in supporting the project, uh, from staff's perspective anyway, where it is majority market housing on city-owned land. Um, and then we're getting back into that realm of, is the city getting the equivalent in terms of land disposition in another form because we can't be supporting businesses directly. So it, it will vary from project to project, but it will have to achieve a high level of affordability within the proposal. So, thanks. Any other comments from council? Seeing none, I'm just gonna suggest that, um, Mr. Simon, if you go away and prepare something for council, we can have a, a, a discussion in council as towards bylaw uh, based on what you've already uh, put together. And then council can uh, can have that discussion at the council table and uh, go from there. Does that make sense? All right. Dude, sorry, through just clarification on that, are you referring to affordable housing reserve bylaw or whatever you're talking about here with this this two step process, land disposition and and the funding. Yeah, uh, through your worship and, and the corporate officer, it's certainly correct me if I'm wrong. When it comes to land disposition, we have a formal process that we would need to follow, and the idea behind this policy is just that low barrier the entry to say non-binding letter of intent from the city we support you will dispose of this parcel to you but then there's still the checks and balances where we have to do a formal bylaw for, for consideration i believe to dispose of the land no we have to do a formal lease agreement well it, it depends how you're going to dispose of it but we need to do formal follow the legislation and advertise and council, we need a council resolution. Yeah. so that process will still serve 
Okay, awesome. Good. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Ms. Moore, you turned the camera on. Did you want to uh, weigh in before we carry on? Uh, through your worship, I was just making myself available if there's any questions about um, bringing forward a bylaw to create a new reserve uh, for affordable housing. Okay, any of you want to talk about that? Not at this point, thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to uh, property reduction and food security. So, Ms. Braun, do you have a presentation? Mr. Atia, you have a presentation. Uh, to your worship, yes, I'll just introduce the uh, team that are there in person to present the new poverty reduction strategy and food security strategy to you. Um, Taha Te, of course, is our uh, community development coordinator. He's been with us in this role for, it'll be almost two years, I guess. And uh, this really represents some of a lot of his work over the past two years, building on work that was done previously by our contract consultant, Jill Zacharias on poverty reduction. Uh, so this is, is a momentous place to get to. Um, there's been a lot of consultation with key partners in the community through the pandemic, post pandemic with the prior council and building on the work, as I mentioned of um, prior consultants and, and and team members over years. Um, I also would like to introduce Melissa Hemphill. She is our food security coordinator contracted through Community Connections with um, funding support from both uh, city taxation and EOF funds. And again, Melissa has been working on um, the food security strategy and the food charter for many years uh, together with, with council and CD. So again, both of these strategies were developed with guidance from the previous council to address poverty reduction and food security needs. And I think it's 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 worth saying that these are really very much in accordance with the strategic priorities of the current council, including affordable housing, socioeconomic impact analysis of development on resort lands, food security, sustainability, and climate action change, climate change action. So I'll turn it over to Taha to go ahead and uh, begin the presentation. Okay, Taha, you're up. Thank you, and thanks. Uh, we got nothing on the screen right now. There we go. Okay. Yeah, sorry today. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for having me today to, to uh, talk about this work that's been ongoing for a couple of years. Um, this opportunity to uh, get funding and and work on the poverty reduction strategy update came up very early in my role with the city, and so um, a good amount of it was was really getting uh, my bearings and and learning the processes and and where those points of leverage for creating affordability, reducing poverty, really exist within the city. So that's that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today, and. Um, I hope we're for ready for a little bit of a philosophical talk as well, because a lot of this is really about um, how how to um, how to get higher, you know, like philosophical sort of goals, long term goals implemented when it comes to more more daily or even weekly, monthly decisions. Um, I will introduce Melissa in a minute here, but I'll just give you an introduction to the poverty reduction strategy and a review of the statistics that you've you've seen before. Um, they just set the stage. So the uh, median median household income and census age distribution. These are really just setting the tone for how much the community has changed in the past fifteen years, but even in the past five years. The rental housing index, that's 2016 rental numbers. The, the number in red is the cost of a two bedroom that was, sur that was surveyed during the 2016 census and the 2022 uh, living wage survey, which shows the cost of a three bedroom more recently, last year. The living wage average for three years, which compares us to a number of interior smaller communities and along with that you know really shows that affordability has been more of a challenge here than even in some other you know larger or or what we think of as destination communities nelson nelson being the, the one there um 
I will also just note that in the in the 2022 living wage, there were, yeah, there were. I, I think there's still data to be collected, and that that, that number could actually be um, could actually be higher with with more accurate data. This home sales data um, was was shared by uh, an appraiser that got in touch after we shared the. Um, the housing mental survey, the 2022 data, and just gave us a bit of a, a an outline of the home sales data and the appreciation that's happened and how that is. We really want to think about how that's being passed on to to renters now. If there's if there are homes being purchased and rented out in this environment, the the rents that need to support those mortgages are just a whole different ballpark. So I've gotten in front of you and, and other groups at that data before, and sometimes I think the reaction can be to clam up because it's a, it's a huge issue and it crosses a lot of different sectors, parts of the community. Um, and really, we, we need to admit here that it's bigger than we as a municipality can address. Um, one of the first, that, that's one of the first things we need to know. Um, but when we think of other examples of where bigger problems have been taken on by municipalities, um, climate change is a really good example, actually, because recognizing that it's a bigger issue, that it's actually global, um, doesn't prevent us from recognizing a, a commitment to, to action. So the, the sector and organizational overview is really about understanding that the services that we have in large part in the community are actually the envy of other communities. And that that's what makes up a lot of the supports. You know, the community makes up a lot of supports that exist here. Um, our ability to leverage funding and, and support the creation of new innovative uh, programs and, and services is really a highlight of um, the work that I've, I've been able to do for the past couple of years. Nevertheless, the nonprofits that offer those services are facing the same cost increases and they don't get to adjust their prices or pass them on to anyone. They're, they're kind of grant, as, as a grant rece receiver, they're, they're taking the price of their services from a different order of government usually. And really this, Yeah, the, the way of working with nonprofits is really something that we want to focus on through this strategy. Um, I, I'll just note that the, the work that, that Mr. Simon just presented is, is a great example of a nonprofit partnership for a really, you know, a goal that, that's extremely important in the community and will have a huge effect on, on affordability. So the, the residents, really the affordability pressures and the poverty that, that's experienced due to rising costs is the focus here. We know that the, we know that residents are being displaced and that the workforce shortage that employers are, are, are noting is connected to that. And there is a record demand for services at the nonprofits still. Um, at some point, those nonprofits might see fewer numbers, but um, that will really be unfortunate and, and probably a, um, a signal that displacement is really picking up. So, Tom, when we're talking about lower numbers, so the nonprofit seeing no lower numbers, are we talking about people now are not just displaced from their home, but they're having to leave our community to be able to survive? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the a lot a lot of this work was. Um, capturing lived experience in various survey formats, right. very, yeah, in various formats, really. And displacement was something that was noted multiple times, and not just of, of um, you know, seasonal residents. In the results from the, from the emergency housing the program, a lot of the residents who actually searched for housing during their stay at, at emergency shelter, they weren't able to find it. 
and, and left the community. The majority actually are in that in that case, in that situation. So, you know, the, the gap that we know exists above the emergency housing into the rest of the continuum is, is a high one. It's a it's a wide gap. So I, I want to I want to clarify this probably more from my own mind than you. So when we're talking about those people who are needing to access emergency housing, we're not talking about people that uh, always people that have uh, you know separated or whatever in their marital scheme. We're talking about full families being displaced. They're looking for housing because now the landlords raised the rent or they've lost their income or whatever the case may be. And they're now we're seeing whole families having to move uh, because of this, correct? Yeah, there's there's um that's that's a great example. We there's not a you know a couple months that go by without a, a revenue rentals popping up with with a family that's in that situation. Right. Um, but another major contributor we have to recognize is that um, empl employment housing at times can, you know, the, the end of an employment contract is the end of a housing contract at the same yeah. time. Yeah. And when that happens at an inopportune time of the year, that is another system that's kind of, that's kind of um, tied up with our, our housing crisis and affordability crisis. Thanks for that clarification. So the available services that we have um, are being stretched, and the next, you know, the next step and the next hard conversations that are going to have to go on at the at the nonprofit level are which to keep and which to see go away, and that's um, that's yeah, really just looking at the at the example that we've set and the and the services that are available, and um, these nonprofits are proud of the work that they do, and they. They know that they're supporting people day in and out, so they they really don't want to see this happen. Um, and the risk to maintain established programs that that just don't have, you know, solid consistent funding is is just a reality. Um, no, nearly yearly um, grants for an ongoing program like the food bank are creating a lot of uncertainty and risk for the nonprofit that operates that service, which we we need as a community. Um, and that's something that really the, the sector overview highlighted is that um, some of some of the services we that are offered, maybe they're they can be considered like uh, a quality of life top up. But these are really like making up, you know, supporting people's people's uh, ability to live. And so then the the you know the full circle comes around and the and the employment shortages and decline of service availability is is employment shortages are going to come into this uh prospect as well they're going to be a prospect as well um again the 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 goal of having these conversations is really to bring us to a new spot as a community and and take stock of our situation um, and inform the community about the realities of, of developing as a destination. Um, those, you know, yeah, those those ideas that we need to, to come in from outside of the community, um, from other communities who've experienced destination development, resort development, um, was a was a key goal of the des the engagement program that we put together. And so acknowledging that. Yeah, our, in, in BC, we're facing the challenges of a growing resort community. Um, we're, we're designated as such by the, by the province, and uh, we have a different set of issues that are coming along with that now. The Revel Broke podcast is a project that we started releasing around March this year. Um, this was a partnership with Stoke FM that was funded by the current grant that you're hearing about, and it coincided with the Affordable Housing Summit, so a real, like, real swell of conversation about affordability and housing that was going on um, just last month. The, obviously, the title is, is pretty tongue-in-cheek. We, Revel Stoke loves its Revel, Revel puns, I guess, uh, and the, 
there's no jest around affordability in the podcast. I think people who listen to it hear pretty pretty quickly that we're serious about the topic and that um, we're looking to have a, a informative and and um, valuable community conversation through it, not to not to uh, poke a wound. Yeah. The five episodes that have have uh, Come out to date, cover the role of governments, lived experience of poverty, housing affordability issues. Um, we talked to property management, rental housing, and real estate professionals, and we get into the resort community housing impacts that are more, um, yeah, that, that we're facing. Um, we're really excited about the uptake that it's had. The, you know, the audience. And the audiences have been consistently quite high um, and, and grown throughout the, the release. And across platforms, that's also quite high, um, along with a lot of a lot of residents finding out about the podcast through um, through radio listenership and then picking it up later. Um, so it was well received. A lot of feedback has been very positive. The last couple of episodes have been paused really because so much has happened in the past even month since uh, you know this the release date started that we have a new we have new information to share and and we really want to highlight the work that the city's doing on housing um, and and talk to those that are that are really informing these decisions, Mr. Simon. Um, yeah, it, it, um, Mr. Parliament as well. Just just a lot of a lot of really key um, and progressive thinking about how to to stimulate housing supply, affordable housing supply. And so those key messages. One one of them you already heard, but also that we benefit from having a diverse economy. Um, a lot of resort and destination locations don't have the benefit of, of the foundation that we do. And that's something that we, we can really um, use to our advantage. We, we have opportunities to influence where we're going. Um, there's, you know, one of the common themes really is that this track of, of development, it, it is one way in in a sense there's there's a lot of growth that comes with being a destination there's a lot of um, visitation that comes with being a destination and that tends to grow over time especially when you have when you have a place that has high quality of life and amenities like we like we have but the how the how you influence your trajectory is is really where it's what's where it is and uh, really where council can make those decisions to to influence our, our, our direction and finally to communicate that our leadership is is acting on this on these issues and planning for the community's future um, there's an amount immense amount of work that's happened in the two years that i've been working for the city of Rosto, um, starting really with the ocp and the amount of collaboration that happened across the community and and internally to make that happen and we're getting to the points where where actionable you know big changes are are achievable and uh, the community needs to know about that um, and I guess by way of that I think I think Melissa's work is a really key part of the change that our community has seen over the past couple of years too um, she's been working on a food security strategy for for a chunk of it and and uh, I was able to get on board towards towards the end of the strategy but um, yeah, please, please uh, come on up and, and share your work with us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. I'll be back. Good. Thanks for having me. I believe you guys have all seen this now, which is great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed reading every detail of it. Um, oh, sorry. I'm doing something um so the 2022 food security strategy is is one in the line of work so we started with a food security charter uh that was adopted by council in 2014 and that's 
a really nice guiding document for how we want to be as a community when it comes to food security. Um, and then uh, a strategy was commissioned by the city, and one of the main recommendations in there was to develop the a food security coordinator position. So here I am, um, eight years later, and uh, we've done a lot. And in section six of the updated strategy, you'll be able to hear about uh, or read about a lot of the successes. Um, and so a new strategy was commissioned um, by two local uh, women, Haley Ross and Amy Clark, who have been involved in the food movement for quite some time, um, right alongside me. And so the strategy is a result of lots of public engagement, uh, identifies, uh, well, revisited our, our food security goals. What do we care about in this community? Um, what's going on? What are the gaps? And then coming up with lots of recommendations of what we could do to improve the situation. Um, and so it followed really similar methodology of measuring our level of food security in the community um, and uh, kind of refined the vision, brought some more uh, social justice elements and uh, reconciliation consideration into the strategy and goals. Um, and so through that me methodology found that while we have increased our local food production by about 10,000 kilos a year, um, it's actually a lower percentage of providing our, our food needs because our population's grown. So we're facing a lot of the same challenges that we were back in 2014, but they're amplified. And the pandemic really showed us that. We all experienced empty store shelves. In fact, yesterday there were no eggs in Ceylon. It still happens. Our supply chains are, are quite threatened. Um, climate change is a major driver of why we need to look at this and not just depend on a global food supply chain to serve our needs. Um, and what and what a great success that we've experienced is an increase in the availability of regionally produced items. So there's a real appetite in the community for local food, um, and that's going really well, and an increase in the quantity and quality of food programming. So Revstil cares uh, about local food, and that's really fantastic. Um, I think it's important to note the two terms, food security and food insecurity. So food security is about everybody's access to food. What is it? Where do you get it? How much does it cost? How well does it serve your needs? And food insecurity is about those folks who can't access what they need for particular reasons. Often it's income, but there's also systemic barriers, physical barriers that get in the way there. And so food insecurity kind of sits under the umbrella of food security. And so I'm able to address uh, both of those elements in the work that I do with community connections through managing the food bank, community kitchen, um, food recovery program, and the policy work. Uh, that we've been working on. So the strategy uh, gives a lot of recommendations for achieving each of the goals that we have, um, but there's 15 very high priority recommendations. So those are the ones we're going to focus on first. Um, they are the highest priority because they have the most potential for building the resilience of our food system and our food security. Um, and because 14% of our of interior health residents are food insecure. And I'd say in Revelstoke, the number is likely higher because of all the affordability issues that we're hearing about. Um, and so that's folks who are living in poverty systemically because of all kinds of reasons in their life or short-term poverty because of a job loss or something. Um, so we try to address all kinds of different things in the strategy and in the work that we do. So moving forward with the plan, it's pretty hot off the presses here. Um, <laughs> We are taking the steering committee that helped to create the strategy um, and turning that into an advisory committee or a working group um, to help implement the recommendations. Um, it's definitely not just my work to fix this problem. Um, there's lots of stakeholders that have uh, opportunity and uh, leadership and purview to be working on this issue in all kinds of different ways. And so to help stakeholders understand that, the first part of unraveling this is uh, meeting with those stakeholders, presenting the strategy, talking about the recommendations that uh, they intersect with, and helping to support them to implement those recommendations uh, in, in whatever way they can. Um, I'm super grateful for the support uh, from CED. 
um, to, to fund the position and, and help to propel the work. It provides leverage for additional funding to accomplish the, the work that we have and, and continues to. Um, some of the things that I'm most excited about in the near future is uh, the opportunity for digging into learning uh, about reconciliation that colonialism plays in our food system today, not just in the past, um, what Indigenous food sovereignty means and what we can do to support it. Um, I'm really excited about getting viable land into production. It's a huge challenge here in Revelstoke with development pressures, cost of land, access to mentorship, skilled labor, all of those things. It's, you know, it's, it's really tricky to increase our food production here. So we need to be creative. We need to be looking at public land, uh, urban land, and, and really think about what we could be doing as a community. We need to utilize um, technology and innovation around greenhouses and vertical growing and all those sorts of things that will help overcome the geographical and climate change challenges that Rothstock has, like gray, cold days like today, <laughs> where greenhouses are sprouting all over the country, but not here yet. Um, I'm also really excited about our community's understanding of food security. Now, I don't like when we first started this work, general population didn't even understand what the term meant, but I think we now do. We get that it's about what food we can access, when and how, and who gets to do that. We understand it's important, and again, we're passionate to support local. Pop down a, a block from here, Saturday, April 29th, I think is the first outdoor market, and you'll witness that, it'll be awesome. Uh, the market is even growing this year because there's such demand. Uh, and the, the last piece I'm really excited about is policy. Yeah, Paul, let's nerd out on some policy. Um, a lot of the recommendations in here that relate to the city are around policy. So helping more food production to happen um, and helping support food or land get into production, um, supporting the staffing, the programming, um, the access to city infrastructure and assets in order to do all of that work um, is, is going to be great. Uh, there's some low hanging fruit uh, in, the, in the strategy for the city to consider and I'm happy to work with staff or council to dig into those things for sure. Um, but some of them that I hope you can consider in the near future as you work on housing developments and land disposition and that sort of stuff is considering the opportunity for producing food on land and what do you have at your disposal for including that in projects um, on public land or private land. Um, and looking at providing in-kind support, especially to farmers markets whenever possible. So that really low barrier to operating those um, and keeping it uh, low cost for the vendors to be there. That's a big piece for those small businesses. Um, and, and working together with CED to develop the metrics and, and continue to measure how we're doing with security over time. Um, so I'm not going to get into any more detail today, but happy to answer any questions. Council, any questions, uh, Melissa? And so, Melissa, I'm going to say uh, I'd like to be in contact with you regarding uh, some of the things that you're bringing up. So, uh, uh, my family comes from a farming heritage, and uh, anything we can do to produce food is something I'm wholeheartedly uh, interested in. So, okay. communicate with that, Councilor Pong. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the report. It's uh, certainly on the action items. There's there's lots there, and mm -hmm. it's uh, probably hard to keep track of them all or whatever. A yeah. uh, couple um, <laughs> couple things to note, and I just. Uh, sort of wondering about your feedback. So with the previous council, one of the innovative uh, things that we did was uh, permit greenhouses officially in front yards. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that has actually- I think we might see it a bit more this summer. This summer, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so any sort of comments on, on that particular initiative and how that might fit in? It's more for homeowners, obviously. And yeah, yeah, for sure. I think um, the- key piece about that for me is open-mindedness about um, food production, farming, uh, even raising animals for food, that it doesn't have to be a hideous, smelly um, eyesore, 
that it can be beautiful, it can complement our community, it can become part of our culture to support that and have it visible and, um, yeah, part of who we are. The, the, another question that I have is on the, uh, so we were talking about the affordable housing and, and these programs for enabling housing programs. In, from your perspective, I don't know if it's in any of the goals or strategies here. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if uh, if there would be some wisdom of having uh, that component for affordable housing, saying that that strengthens the application of you know, community gardens or whatever. And I'm not sure what all the you know the barriers uh, for that are in affordable housing units. Um, but I, I, I think back to my childhood, uh, living in affordable housing or government subsidized housing, we did have uh, that, that was a crucial component of our ability to live there was um, that we had a garden and uh, enjoyed it. So I, I yeah, just to any sort of comments on that as it applies to that policy that we we're talking about earlier. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think it should be encouraged um, and considered around the financial implications of maintaining that but that that's given a priority because what fires my passion about food is um how it brings people together and i think in any housing development uh, and in rebel Stoke as a whole community is what it's all about and so a garden is in a magical place to bring people together um to share skills to share food share life um, so I think any way that we can um, incentivize it and support it to happen is a good idea, um, but recognize that it, it requires ongoing work um, to maintain and bring people together. It may not happen all on its own. And yeah, so I think it's an important consideration. And then uh, last uh, sort of question. Uh, so on the local food initiative, the farmer's market, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, of course, Everybody in Revelstoke loves it, and uh, uh, a, um, and there's been different sort of ebbs and flows over time. Is there anything that at the council level it isn't working quite well now? And is there stuff at the council level, policy level, that you know, uh, is there any sort of anything off the top of your mind? Uh, um, and, and maybe it's a conversation for later on in one on one. But mm -hmm. is there is, is it working? So I think from the community's perspective, it works really, really well. It's mm -hmm. a sort of celebrated place. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's always these sort of organizational or uh, logistics, I guess, challenges. And mm -hmm. is there any sort of barriers that you're facing from the city side? I think, again, the easiest thing would be in kind support um, to operate the market. Um, but no, I mean, generally, I've worked a lot with Lori, <laughs> um, making it all happen. And, and that's goes really well and it's really well received in the community and um the two markets that even work together a little bit now which is great there's some good progress there um so i think um access to electricity in the location is a little bit of a challenge um not an easy one to overcome costly but uh like the light or the the outlets are up high on the the lamp posts and requires a little bit of a ladder excursion to get up there and for vendors to be able to plug in their freezers or their coffee machine or whatever it is. But those generally the biggest barriers um, that we're facing now. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Great, Mr. Thank Simon. You. Through your worship to Councilor Palmer, just um, for Council's benefit, the land position policy does have a reference in there to community gardens specifically. Oh. So those amenities are a piece of the evaluation report. Oh, awesome. awesome, perfect, good. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, yeah. yeah, just to, on that land disposition policy, I think it's it'd be great. I think there's a uh, in Canmore and in Radium. I think there's two two examples of these deep winter greenhouses where they're able to produce you know nine ten months out of the year. So I think that'd be a you know a really cool feature to have in our community. Um, and I think it becomes an educational component um, you know for 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 everyone as to where our food comes from. So I, I'd be fully in support of that. So thank you. Just a good moment. Just question, thank you, Melissa. Has um, Revelstoke ever considered a, a concept of an urban farm? Well, in the back of the strategy, you'll see my drafted urban ag policy. 
and we're working with uh, Parks and Rec on the Powerhouse Road site um, to develop a, a community fund. Exactly. Um, one of my key considerations in that project, though, is to create financial sustainability and not re reply or require grants for operational longevity. Um, so we'll have to have some sort of social enterprise as part of that. Um, and it's it's a limited uh, amount of land. So farm might be a bit of a stretch um, mm -hmm. in terms of sizing. And so my my hopes there is that we kind of demonstrate that it can be a great project and can be beautiful and can benefit the community. Uh, and then maybe we can find some other opportunities. Yeah, I'm working with uh, Royal Roads University right now on um, a project called Reimagining uh, the Future of Food Systems. And a lot of it is based around uh, equity and social justice. And so the project has three parts. The first part was um, some justice, equity, decolonization, and inclusion workshops, which uh, some of you were able to come to. Second part was uh, developing an equity toolkit to evaluate food programs, make sure that we're not just serving uh, the privileged through those programs, that we're actually making a, a difference. And the third part is, uh, it's a little obtuse, but it's a visualization project to explore what we could be doing with uh, some land around the community, what we, how we could develop it into food projects. And so hoping to, potentially work with you on, on what those sites could be. Um, it's not it's not asking for any promises. It's just mm -hmm. saying, hey, let's have a, a look at what this could actually look like. Um, in 2020, the Local Food Initiative uh, and I worked on a community farm concept, um, but the site that it was proposed, the neighbors showed up and were really unsupportive of the idea. Um, they thought it would be ugly and smelly and bring in all kinds of pests and be a real problem. And so I think I'm like, whoa, that's a really different vision from what we had. And so some visualization to help us align of what some food projects could look like in the community uh, will hopefully be very helpful to boarding them on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to tour one outside of Ottawa, which okay. is actually in the city. The, the urban yeah. farm I toured was actually in the city, but boy, when I toured that, I was educated yeah. on the, the potential. Yeah, for sure. And what the city could do working mm -hmm. with the different groups on yeah. building a sustainable urban farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think involving youth, involving indigenous yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, populations would be amazing. Yeah. Bring together lots. Of Thank you. Councilor mm -hmm. uh, Just further to uh, that theme, um, at UBCM, they had a tour, uh, farm tour in Squamish, uh, yeah, which was the Musqueam. Yeah, it was wow. There was there was several. I went to, uh, I think about five. Yeah, but uh, quite quite amazing projects. Also, right within the, and again, the idea of urban farm. Uh, I think one of the big. I was expecting to see big farms, quite frankly, yeah. and uh, and and they all these were were very small, yeah, small but they became yeah. viable. So it was an interesting example. Um, so I think you're in touch or know some of the people. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> yeah, because your name came up yeah. uh, uh, on more than one occasion. So yeah, it was pretty pretty cool to see what they were doing there. Mm -hmm. um, the other example that uh, was interesting for me was uh, um, was in Seashell for a period of time, um, and there they had uh, lineal gardens mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, on boulevards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I to tell the truth, I, uh, or to be honest, I was pretty skeptical you know seeing them and and yet they they worked mm -hmm. uh was quite quite astounding so basically if you you know whatever area you know, have these lineal farms that were worked uh, and so that was in collaboration with the uh the municipality there right. yeah yeah i think there's lots of fun opportunities that can really be impactful uh, both on building community and supporting food security so um i recognize that Revelstoke is not the only community working on this. Most communities are. There's some excellent models out there and uh, we have a community of practice across the province where we share ideas and uh, learning and there's lots of connectivity and sharing of, of ideas. We love to rip off and duplicate what works rather than uh, make our own mistakes. Um, so yeah, the, the opportunities are endless. That's what this is. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the presentation, uh, Ta and Mel. Um, I was just wondering if there is a program or businesses that are working to um, go onto residential lands and farm the land and either contribute um, what's grown either to the food bank or the market. Um, coming from Calgary, the YYC Growers and Distributors um, are a great organization um, that um, are all under this one umbrella and they're all working um, separately inside the city, but working together to create CSA boxes and stuff like that. And wondering if um, there's any plan for that kind of program here. Um, there's not specifically like that. I think the best example we have in town is First Light Farm, um, the, the newest farm in town. Oh, second newest, sorry, there's a newer one. Um, they're over in the Big Eddy and they run a fundraiser every year where it's like a GoFundMe campaign uh, where they collect donations. I think their target five or $10,000. And basically that just buys products from them that gets delivered, uh, picked and delivered the morning of the food bank distribution on Fridays. Wow. And so it supports that local business um, that's starting up. Farming is not for those who like to be rich. <laughs> Um, generally. Uh, so it's supporting that new business, but it's also providing the food bank with super fresh, super local organic products, which is so appreciated um, and, and feeds much more than just bellies. So I think that's the best example we have around here. Um, but I, I do think there's opportunity to develop more of those sort of CSA type of projects where uh, customers are investing up front in what a farm can produce um, and perhaps doing that on different tiers. So there's, you know, there's Terra Firma CSA, which is pretty pricey, uh, and there's a food bank. And so what's in between? Um, and maybe we can create some options through a community farm. Okay. Um, yeah, because I know that there are um, some businesses in Calgary that go straight from development of the garden boxes to they will maintain them throughout the summer and then they harvest them. Mm -hmm. um, some of them put a portion of that back towards the resident um, or that can just get donated or sold um, through different farmers markets. Um, I'd also like to stress, I know we it came up at another committee, the whole meeting about the zoning bylaw rewrite and um, agriculture, whether it comes to livestock or growing and just how important that is that we really address that. And I know as we talk towards uh, more density um, that we still have to take this into consideration, even if it is vertical farming and stuff like that, that it is really important um, to the community. Um, and one last thing, when we talk about the food bank, a program that is running consistently and is dependent on grants every year, um, how hard that can be um, for them to budget and how hard it is um, with like the, the grant, grant applications um, and presentations, how hard it is for other organizations to go up there and ask for money while the food bank is asking for money. There's huge community support for the food bank, but it's hard for these other organizations to come and try to take money as they see it away from the food bank at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a good idea for us as a city to see how we can leverage OAP, um, MRT funds, anything that we could put directly towards the food banks, just to give them a little bit more stability. Mm -hmm. We see their numbers continue to climb as well as inflation continue to rise and their food dollars not going as far, um, just to kind of help stabilize that as we move forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We, have no, we have no poor funding at the food bank. There's no guarantees. Yeah. of any money we're getting. So any support is welcome. In 2020, well, prior to the pandemic, we served about 300 families or households a year. Uh, in 2022, we served 700, more than double. And we also have to pay the higher cost of food and the higher cost of staffing. Councilor Levy. Uh, your worship, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Melissa and Taha, for the presentation. Um, I do appreciate it. Uh, uh, when I first came here in 2008, one of my reasons for uh, coming here was that uh, was the realization that we were going to see a lot of change, and that makes it much more interesting for me uh, to uh, go through that. Um, and uh, I think uh, sort of our test as a community. 
Uh, one of them is how we uh, manage ourselves through these challenging issues and how we, uh, uh, you know, navigate um, challenging waters and uh, make active efforts to benefit and uh, support uh, uh, those who uh, may face uh, challenges as a result of those changes. And I just want to thank you both uh, for being uh instrumental in being part of this. Uh, 2014, as you mentioned, the this uh, strategy was adopted. So it's uh, seen a lot of development. I'm very impressed. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say and just note that, um, you know, I don't think at the time people could have conceived uh, uh, how far we've come in some of the things we've done. And and I guess the, use, uh, the word I would use is develop a culture around uh, these things, around food especially. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, not just not in Revelstoke, but in general, uh, you know, we sort of uh, conceived of it differently as like, this person needs something right now, so we're going to give them something, you know, right away. And, and that's, you know, still part of it. But um, it's developing so many more resilient things. That's amazing to see. Um, I just have two questions. Uh, one is specific, the more is maybe a little general. Um, the first one is regarding the proposal, and I know it's not uh, approved or completed yet uh, for the uh, food security, food uh, for the gardens at uh, Powerhouse Road. Yeah. Um, if you could just elaborate a little bit more on size and what is exactly planned, so that's uh, for conceived there. Uh, so that's the first one. And then the second one, I guess the more um, one I'd like to focus on is under the discussion section of this report, there's a dozen different sort of action items here. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering sort of what will council be seeing? What will you need from council? What requests from council? And what is the timeline mm -hmm. for moving through all of these uh, more specific breakaways uh, that uh, are before us in the report here? Okay. So, thank you. Sorry, do we know what size it is? Okay, we're going to look up. Okay, sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Not fresh in our heads. Um, I, I guess I'm going to throw that question back. What would you like to see? How would you like to work together? Mm -hmm. What what works? What lines up? Um, you know, you're more familiar with processes and how things can work. And so um, definitely like work closely with Taha and Ingrid and mm -hmm. integrate with that work. And so um, I'm happy to come back and present more and talk more and mm -hmm. or work with staff or mm -hmm. yeah, whatever. I'm here. That's what I do. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're quite, you know, so for example, just to pick one, like developing recommendations for improving food security or collaborating on, um, you know, key actions identified in the destination management plan. I mean, a general comment I'll give to everybody when they say, how do we interface with council is, come at, is to come at us with solutions, you yeah. know, like, yeah, yeah. so that's, that's an important piece of advice yeah, there, but totally. yeah, maybe stuff and more about all the details or what they're conceived of, or maybe even what's just is likely to be next in the next six months, what mm -hmm. things are becoming. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think we're anticipating some policy work mm -hmm. um, and uh, excited about, uh, yeah, pulling the resources and, and knowledge that I have to inform that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't, I, don't know. I don't know how we do this. We keep plugging away. Um, if, I'm happy to meet with mm -hmm. counselors one on one, and we can champion something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's a huge list of recommendations. So to be honest, it's overwhelming, mm -hmm. um, and it's again, it's not about me doing the work. It's about the different stakeholders. So if there's something that gets you excited, something you think is easy, um, and you need my support moving it forward, then mm -hmm. let me know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, or Councillor Dublin is the council rep on the food security advisory committee so that's a good channel to go through yeah, um and yeah mm -hmm. yes, you. Yeah, yes just to speak to uh councillor lando's question through your worship i think there's multiple opportunities to carry this work forward one is through the capacity of our staff person taha as he uh, works with the food security coordinator and our other partners to identify priorities the second is through our committees of council the, the commission and the social development committee a lot of these recommendations overlap with their recommendations and the work they're doing to advance these issues the third is as we know funding opportunities which sometimes bring certain recommendations to the top of the pile because it's like look there's funding for this let's work on this and that's when we usually come back to council with a, a proposal to submit an application to say UBCM or Etsy um, in pursuit of these. And we will use both of these strategies to inform that application development 
and to leverage the funds that you've already committed as a council to the position and to Taha's work and uh, bring them forward as they arise. Thank you. Any other questions from Melissa before we move on? 1.8 acres. 1.8 acres. Oh, great. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Taha, you're back up. Yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Back. Um, so just heard an example of some great work being done in the community and and as as amazing as Melissa is, that's just one example of great work that's being done in the community. Um, so one of the targets of these staff policy recommendations is to look at a broader scope of how we are enabling nonprofits and organizations in the community to do their work and to partner to do their work on, on objectives that we share with them. Um, these are draft policy recommendations. It's important to note. Um, there's more conversation that needs to happen at multiple levels to implement a few of them. Um, but the, the conversation sort of starts here. So one of the important things to note with the next couple of years of uh, social development of, of support in the community is that housing is our primary focus as, as a community right now. Um, but housing takes a couple of years at the minimum to start showing up. And the relief of a housing crisis doesn't show up until many years after that likely as we, as we play catch up. So in a, in a lot of this work, um, affordability and housing are synonymous uh, to, to myself and I think to the community, they're the same thing, but affordability can be supported in more ways than housing can. Um, the top recommendations are focused on the next couple of years. So before housing shows up, what are we, what are we doing? Um, and they really are adaptable to conditions, to opportunities that might be presented by uh, the food security strategy or might be funded by different levels of government. That's something that we respond to often is where's the funding coming from? Uh, we'll dive in. This one is uh, aligned with one of council's objectives to um, create advocacy efforts to UDCM. And it's really about advocacy for funding programs that uh, don't accept local data to prove the cost of living. Um, whatever form it needs to be in, like we, we can invest in. That's something that will make returns in spades. But um, not being able to prove that the cost of rent in Relistoke is you know, double what it was in 2016 in a lot of cases is a real hindrance to creating health. And so that advocacy is really key. Uh, we'd love to see the city become, you know, a leader in, in these sorts of initiatives where we can we can be leading the community and showing commitment to, to supporting nonprofits in a way that they can dictate what it is. But they're, they're getting some capacity, maybe, maybe it's just volunteer time, but, but we're facilitating the way for, for, um, you know, for, for members of the community that, that already we know care about uh, Revelstoke and, and work for the city to be able to access it. And then lay the, lay the foundation for other, other um, businesses, other organizations to, to uh, get on board. Um, social procurement policies are something that a lot of communities consider as a way of making their dollars go towards social goals. So when we're buying a service, when we're, when we're um, you know, basically when we're, when we're contracting service and there is a nonprofit alternative that can, uh, can support ongoing initiatives. So um, then, then procuring it that way means that 
we're providing funding that we would have otherwise by grant or in kind, um, but through actually supporting a social enterprise. And being able to do this really, really will support the growth of social enterprises that a lot of a lot of organizations are looking to, frankly, because uh, grant dollars don't cut what they need to get done and what they what they do in the community. Um, the, the last one here is just the, one of the key affordability factors for families is is local child care, and we have a really dedicated group that works on child care um, that that works specifically on the licensing and administration uh, that creates child care spaces, often people that are running child care out of their homes. And the licensing, the licensing uh, process could be one that we pay a lot of attention to streamlining as a way of saying, like, as a way of saying child care is a, is a good trajectory, it's a good path, it's well supported by the community. And there's a lot of opportunity in it. If, if someone wants to start a business in childcare, let's, let's support them to do that. And the returns to uh, the community in terms of, in terms of you know, workers that are available, women that, parents that can, that can uh, be in the community and work when they have childcare, uh, will, will pay dividends. Um, I'll pause there. Uh, just for any comments, because this right. really needs to be a discussion. Uh, right. And we'd right. love, love to hear from you. Yeah, so uh, I was going to start off, but Aaron, you had a council room. Oh, your worship, thank you. Um, speaking on point number seven, um, uh, what are our, what are our uh, easily obtainable goals and objectives? I've certainly heard from people in child care about some of the challenges. Uh, do we have, for example, from a uh, lobbying uh, provincial or senior government uh, perspective, or uh, is there is there what can we do that is going to bear fruit uh, soon? Uh, any suggestions? Some of so a lot of this is about identifying like what's low hanging fruit that would that would be implementable in the next couple of years. You know the, the mm -hmm. programs um, and, and advocacy here. That's that's something that people could put together. You know staff could put together um, with direction. The licensing and administrative capacity, in some parts, the burden of that is put on people who are applying for childcare. Mm -hmm. And so what they what they get um, in the in the situation of applying for childcare is a stack of forms. Mm -hmm. And um, that that can be just a barrier, like frankly, to to um, someone who, who would very much want to do that and very much want to get a license to, to provide child care, mm -hmm. um, but is intimidated just by that presentation and not having someone to just guide them through it to mm -hmm. offer some capacity for that. Um, so yeah, that, that is the type of uh, like low hanging fruit that, that comes along with uh, recommendations like this. Mm -hmm. So Taha, do we have people in the community that could support that, um, you know, let us help you get through the paperwork scenario. Oh yeah, absolutely. The child, the local child care society is one of those that um, that they work to increase the capacity and supply of, of child care throughout the community. That's that's one of their their goals overall. And so, yeah, really going to them and asking, okay, wh where can we support you to right. to create this the spaces that we need uh, badly in the community. To grow, to grow as a, um, to grow businesses, to do all the things that a, a community needs to, to flourish. Okay, so at, at some point, uh, I'll have that conversation with you offline about uh, about that sort of thing. So having a friend who was into, <clears throat> excuse me, childcare and and saw that same sort of scenario. Uh, able to get through it only with the support of others and and be able to carry on uh, yeah i i'm understanding that sort of thing but I, I you know how can we as a council support those people whether it be through financial or just uh, capacity or whatever those are conversations that we need to have yeah um i 
We're going to talk about how and okay. more at, at a higher level in a second. Okay. Um, so hold that thought. The uh, RMR socioeconomic impact study is one that that uh, CD has put in our work plan for this year, and that we, you know, really want to understand um, what is what is the impact on on community on our both lots of positive and, and also and, and also impacts that uh, that we're that we're dealing with now as a community in in more uh, in more detail. Okay. Uh, point five is is another way of, of communicating what I think council is just asking um, Melissa about, which is um, how can how can we support the farmers market? What what how can we get out of the way? In other words, or if we're already you know if we have capacity or resources or infrastructure that you could access and really negligibly increases our operational costs. How do we offer that? Um, there's examples of that happening now and, and uh, encouraging those would be a huge jump forward for the social sector. Um, this this one is, I think, pretty pretty well established with this council is uh, the funding for ongoing nonprofit low market housing development. That's, that's the that's a nonprofit housing society or any version of going forward on that on that um, on that goal. It's going to be a foundation foundational for our progressive community. Um, the last three, uh, I'm going to put you on hold for because <laughs> first the we're just going to talk a little bit about the role, like really really the role um, that I stepped into existed. Um, there's a contractor that did it for many years, but the integration of the role into the, the uh, municipality is really what has enabled a lot of this work. And at this point highlighted a lot of opportunities, but also um, opportunities to, to improve as well. And yeah, that, that's really where we're at, where I'm at with it is, uh, is uh, I'm, I'm, I've been supported a lot with, with my progress and, and the next recommendations are really about capitalizing on that progress. And um, we, as a community, are really uh, often approaching council to get direction on very high-level goals, um, long-term high-level goals that um, we don't find the time to discuss often enough. Uh, but we, we have some time right now, so <laughs> let's try. Really, um, you know, this is this question right here, or the next part of the discussion here is going to be about um, where CD fits into that picture of, of understanding community goals and how that aligns with council's highest priorities, whether that's sustainability or housing or climate. A lot of what we do is have a vantage point where we collaborate with other departments, where we access funding opportunities. We understand community perspectives, whether they're an organization or a nonprofit, and ultimately align partnerships and collect that information to have council leverage it to the, to the maximum degree. Um, but our role also depends on understanding your goals in more depth. And uh, you might have seen my background. It's council's priorities <laughs> because because that's uh, that's a valuable document where where council goes, uh, city staff can follow quite keenly, and and doors start opening and um, and you know yeah yeah partnerships are are a lot more viable internally and externally. Um, the alignment is really what that speaks to, and. Really, these opportunities, say an urban farm in, in, this, in the example we just discussed, they're subject to municipal support. Um, the land that, that would be made available for that, that may not have any other use, um, that's really at the council's discretion to make use of. And then there are a lot of outcomes already that, um, that, 
that I think I, I'm proud of, and I, I'm proud to have worked with uh, with other departments and other um, other staff to achieve, and they're really worth highlighting because they they are a good template for how we can move forward on a number of these goals. So housing and the housing sector and, and child care are our success story right now. Um, the, the presentation that, that you got from uh, development services today and the understanding of, of nonprofits and uh, grant funding considerations that, that come with that are really, um, yeah, I, I was able to, to work with Paul pretty directly on that. And, and we know that we're gonna be relying on a nonprofit to, to develop housing in the future and and resourcing them with with funding was something else that uh, that the municipality did, did recently that's going to move us ahead. Uh, in childcare, I um, was able to work with Mr. Nato recently to make use of um, childcare you know space in the community center that wasn't being utilized after three o'clock, and so the after school society that provides affordable childcare for for um, for children was it was able to access that space and and use an underutilized asset that the city had and we have we have more opportunities like that uh, that, that could be highlighted uh, the the work that you're hearing about the, the zoning and, and capacity work that was created in Melissa's position but also it, uh, it it's for that reason actually reached the level of um, sophistication and and uh, readiness to work with with uh, mr simon on on zoning and creating more more land for, for food production and uh, the final example here is just about the extreme heat planning grant that, that we recently secured and with the support of um, emergency services and the fire department really those are those are the professionals within the city who who are going to be here for us when when there's a, a crisis situation and this work is going to let them interface with the nonprofit sector to meet the needs of community members before during and after uh, a crisis comes to comes to play and uh really you know enhances our resili resilience before the heat of the heat emergency is declared maybe when it's just a heat warning um, we can start identifying who's uh, who's at risk and planning for how to support them. Um, so now the widest lens we get, we we've got uh, the the official community plan, the OCP, is is just a way for for CD uh, for for CD and the city and the community to to understand uh, our our vision for the future. And I, I, I guess the, the point I want to emphasize is that the more that, that we pick this document up, um, the more we may realize that you know, solutions or, or um, recommendations that have already been adopted by council are actually supportive of what we need to do. Um, and that's, you know, not everyone can be an expert on every part of the OCP, but um, a number of us in the room helped write that, so we should we should be able to point you that in that direction. And then, when council does issue a direction, um, how do we understand those goals more fully? If the the discussion didn't get to every nuance, um, there's there's a lot of work that has to be done in between meetings and in between opportunities to access council. So the OCP is another asset in that way, and that council and staff collaborated to, to a great extent to create it, and that a lot of that vision for the future is embedded and uh, can be mined for, for valuable insight. Uh, I've been talking for a while. I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. <laughs> but the OCP lenses are really uh, what I want to focus on here, because as a way of having the big discussions that we, we need to as a community, um, the lenses are were the way that were communicated as the highest kind of outlook of what to be focused on. And sense of community is the first one. Um, and that it's encouraged and really created through how we develop 
develop as a our, our built infrastructure. So, you know, farming is another great example. Like creating a, a norm where where farming is visible. That's that's one of those sensitive community items. Uh, equity is a second lens, and it really is about recognizing that um, we as a community are diverging in, in our um, in our really there's a wealth wealth gap that's create, created in the community, um, and that there's a lot that we um, we need to look forward to and be ready to support in order to um, in order to have a healthy economy that that functions in this in this environment. And then climate change is the last and the third and last lens. And um, really those that appears on council's goals now, I think it's it's in everyone's minds as we uh, enter summer and see and see the changes every year seemingly that uh, are upon us. And those those lenses, the more often they're applied to decisions, the really but we can we can get the most value out of them by applying them to decisions more often is is really the the goal of of what um, the last few recommendations are um, and and the discussions that will go on from them. Um, so I think let me skip to them because I didn't think it was gonna take this. You can you can get this slideshow off of me. It's really <laughs> good. You can take a lot of effort into making it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what we just talked about were were a lot of really um, socioeconomic implications that have to do with council's long term priorities. Uh, that's the short list of them, but really the implications are pretty far reaching. And so the shorthand is, is really to embed those lenses more often into discussion. And so if we, if we look at them through the lens, um, it, it simplifies our, our thinking and gives us a little bit more of uh, a process to be able to, to start addressing these things. So affordability and poverty reduction is just one of the goals that we have as a community, but it's made up and it's an outcome of a lot of repeated and value certain decisions that come before council. And so the, the opportunity to discuss them, even if it's only in, in passing, uh, but more frequently is, is what the the last recommendations really address. So we've got some hairy problems um, and we've got some limitations, but we also have assets of leveraging partners partnerships in the community and alleviating some of the impacts on nonprofit organizations that we can by investing in them. The, Third recommendation is to review these, these policies that policies don't get picked up usually when they're going to be used, um, but policies that have a, a direct impact or effect on services or costs that are incurred to low income families, they're the ones that can support affordability most readily. Um, so it, whether that's, you know, right now the city also provides free bus passes, a certain, a certain number but we, the direction that, that um, the policy states is that community connections will apply under an existing grant and aid policy. And that grant and aid policy is you know, dated and it doesn't really create a, a number of uh, tickets that's actually supportive of the amount of ridership we have. So something as, as obscure or, you know, um, that's on that's on one policy it does have an impact on affordability and that's and that's really what we're looking at we'd be looking at reviewing in, in this process uh, the second is to a lot of the policy that the, and recommendations that come out of this are actually existing in the ocp and in other documents so picking them up and, and referencing them 
when when it comes to decisions, those are really those are really the um, things that we can highlight. And then ultimately, the goal would be to address just just um, really to embed this this type of uh, this type of process in decision making at the community level. So that could look like a lot of different things. Um, it's not really on me to to fully map that out, but it's there's those are conversations that um, when when the council you know, leads conversations just like the one that, that uh, was had before on where can we get behind food production? Um, that's what that's where we as staff can, can move ahead knowing that the values that council has support work that we're doing. Maybe, uh, maybe blunt, uh, thank you for this, but uh, when we start talking about these policies and they're they're already embedded in our OCP process. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that um, when some of these policies need to be changed, that you feel that needs to come directly to council? Or do you feel that you and staff have the ability to um, alter these processes by discussing this at the management meeting and, and moving things forward? And that might be more of a question for Mr. Parliament than it is for you, but. Um, I'm asking that question to maybe streamline these things and and give you the ability to make these changes if so desired or, or needed. Yeah, I guess like um, this all this all comes as really like uh, an observation that um, we have we have quite a well alive we have we have a council that's that's recently elected and, and looking for for levers on. A number of these issues, and um, the more that they're picked up and discussed at the council level, the more clear that we're going to be on on how to implement them, regardless of where we sit in this, regardless of position in the city. Um, and so, that that I guess is the tool that that I want to impress most is is um, is that finding ways to to discuss those more often and and more regularly. Um, whether that's, you know, yeah, the frequency really depends on what, what the implementation really uh, depends on, on a, an approach that Mr. Parliament, Parliament and, and management will, will, uh, will work towards, but um, just the knowledge of, of, of where we're being steered is, is really, uh, I, I think, for example, that's housing was the subject of the whole election. Mm -hmm. um, and the minute that the council sitting was was elected, um, housing became a priority before uh, council even spoke a word because it was very very clear. Uh, and so when it comes to you know, very very high level policies, um, having that having sandbox outline is is really um, yeah that that's really what enables us. Okay, so. I'll just encourage you to have that conversation with management in this department and then those things that um, need to come to council or should come to council or our conversation with staff on some of these priorities mm -hmm. come to this table so that we can have that conversation and through whatever method, whether through uh, you know our committees or whether it's through committee of the whole or whatever. But I think you've seen around this table, this, um, this council is all about uh, we, we've set plans in place. We, we've done the work in the background by prior uh, prior councils, and now things are in the place to, to put things in place. And, and so if we can help uh, move things forward in a fashion that's actually going to impact community in a positive way quicker, then that's what we want to do. And so you know, I don't want to step out of bounds and say, that's where we need to go. But I think that conversation can be had internally. Do you have any comment, Mr. Parliament? No, absolutely. I mean, this is a this is a very, very comprehensive policy and strategy and recommendations. And we've we've hit on some of them. You, you alluded to the the uh, council priorities. Mm, yeah, and, and we spoke about them yeah. before just in like yeah, at like the housing sport. summit mm -hmm. and the APRE event and, and 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 the recent announcement, and there'll be more. Um, I know there's a lot here. 
and it's a it's a very broad topic, but I'm also mindful of the time. Yeah. And um, you know, we have a, a special council meeting, and then I have to head out early selfishly to tend to table. So we're not going to be able to solve all of it tonight, but um that is a good summary. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for uh Taha, Councillor Orlando? Uh, uh, your worship, uh, not a question, but just a, a comment. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, for the presentations for Taha and Melissa again. And uh, just um, I, I know that these topics are of uh, great importance to the community. And so I just appreciate you uh, uh, providing the update and a comment for council in general. Um, I just wanted to to note that in my experience um, at council, we tend to hear from a limited uh, section of the community uh, just due to the nature of our business, um, but always keep, uh, uh, just, I try to, and I recommend as well, to keep everyone in mind, and not that you don't, uh, through uh, decisions. And I think, you know, highlighting, for example, a, sp a specific uh, anecdote from the presentation of increasing from 300 to 700 households accessing the food bank in, in just a short period of two years is, uh, uh, and as well as some of those, you know, alarming statistics on rental costs and uh, uh, housing costs of, of which we're often aware is um, just a real sort of uh, eye opener to some of the experiences that people in the community are facing. And I certainly, you know, in my interpersonal context, uh, I'm in touch with some people, a small section of people who are facing those uh, challenges. And um, I just want to just make sure we uh, recognize that some voices are underrepresented in our considerations and we need to keep those uh, in mind. And that, uh, you know, in my view and my philosophy, our success is uh, judged on our ability to, uh, to you know, to um take effective action uh that meets um some of uh you know sort of meets the needs of our community members and just one last anecdote it was an anecdote uh read or sorry angus reed uh poll from yesterday but you know overwhelmingly showing that the number one issue in the province uh, right now for voters at the provincial level is affordability issues and we you know we have to uh in any way we can uh you know keep focus on that but thank you Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Taha. Appreciate Thanks it. Your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to uh, Mr. Nano. Do you have uh, your first quarter report? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just in front of you, you'll have the first quarter report reporting January to March. So just outlining the different programs and some of the participation that we had in the community. This quarter, we were able to offer a few different community events. We hosted the annual Family Day State, and this year we were also able to host the annual Family Day Swim. Both those events were provided um, with a grant that we received from BC RPA in conjunction with the province, and as well, Tim Horton sponsored the goodies for everyone. We had over a couple hundred people attend each of those events. Um, we also had some additional events at the arena. We had the firefighters and the RCMP charity hockey game, which also saw about 200 people at the event. And then the Revelstoke After School Society also held a hundred event at the facility. And I think about 180 people attended that event as well. And then the season wrapped up with the annual Fritter Skating Club Carnival and then minor hockey um, different tournaments and championships were held at the arena. And you can also see the summary of annual ice hours booked. We far exceeded our ice hours um, for the 2022-2023 season in comparison to pre-COVID times. So we're fairly busy these days, um, lots going on, and I'm happy to answer any questions if council has any. Council, any questions for Mr. Nato? That's fun. All right, thank you, Mayor Souls. Um, so, uh, Lori, um, like, one comment first is on the uh, social media posts. I see them I, and I, I appreciate them. I think the, the, what I'm, the feedback that I'm getting is the community also appreciates that in that that's a, of course a limited audience in the Facebook world um but uh, it seems that it gets shared I do share and I think other counselors do as well so uh, thank you for that um there's two things that uh two comments that I get 
most frequently and one you're addressing. So that's the swimming pool hours, and we all want more swimming. I hear it over and over again, and uh, and and you're doing active recruiting and trying to do that. The programs for the lifeguard, you know, there's so many things you're trying to do. Are, are you having some success? Are we going to get to the day where we're open seven days a week again and have morning, morning uh, toonie swims or whatever, you know, whatever those things are? That's uh, a theme that I just hear over and over again. So how are we making progress or are we still in this sort of real tough time of not being able to get people? It's still tough. We are we are having casuals come and go, and that's really what the issue is. It's challenging to get someone to commit to full time position. Um, and that's just the nature of a recreation job. People like to have part-time positions that are often recreating. They have more than um, the jobs that they have are seasonal. So they may ski in the winter, work in the summer, vice versa. So that's the challenge that we're having. This summer, we are getting back a lot of our university students and they're looking for hours and work. So we are considering opening Sundays from May till the end of August. Um, we're trying to map up that schedule and have certainty around um, the hours that people can work because it's really important to make sure that we have a commitment from those individuals that they will show up on the scheduled shift. Otherwise, we get into a situation where we're canceling public swims and then causing more frustration in the community about canceled swim times. So it's just trying to make sure that whatever we're offering, we can offer from the day we initiate it, the day we say we're going to end it. Um, so we, we're gonna, I think we're looking good for the summer. Um, in September, we'll follow through with their, our annual shutdown, and then hopefully in October, we can wrap up again. Um, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, really good. And yeah, the cancellations can be very frustrating. I know there's, yeah, your logistics, that's a, a challenge. I'm glad I don't have. Um, uh, one of the ideas that was uh, that I've heard people have relayed to me was uh, sort of a kind of the pop up events, and I don't know if they're logistically possible, but something to think, you know, if there was a surprise Sunday opening that, that, as opposed to a surprise Saturday cancellation. So, just an idea. Uh, uh, there's those, but it looks like it's cautiously optimistic for the summer, so that's great. Yeah, um, I think we're looking good. And then the, the second question I had, um, I know it's been addressed before, but the access into the building. So there was a significant change that happened during the COVID times and it's partially come back, but notably uh, for the farmer's market, the you know, routing people around, I think it's something that we really need to improve that. And then from the uh, parking uh, on the, uh, the city side or the downtown side. so. I, I, I'm not asking for an answer, but I, I hear that over and over. And, and quite frankly, I get frustrated too when I go there and say, oh, I got to walk all, all the way around. It, there there's, seems to be this contradiction on the service level. So I, I, I won't, you can comment if you wish. I'm not asking for it, but I just, just thought I'd highlight that at this point. Thank you. All right, Councillor Stapenhurst. I just wanted to <clears throat> echo what uh, Councillor Pollard just said in regards to the uh, by the, uh, the farmer's market there during the, during the winter. Um, I've heard from from several of the vendors that it's uh, not idealistic to have an entry through the back way, and like when you enter through the front, you don't even realize there's a market going on. And if we can steer just a little bit of that traffic, the foot traffic that's going through the main lobby to the farmers market, you know that can help everybody out. I mean, it's also I think it's more encompassing of the community. So you know maybe that's something we could look at in the future. Okay, so uh, Mr. Nato can take that into advisement and see what works best for her staff. Councillor Alana. Just to worship, uh, your worship, thank you. Just to follow up on these questions, why are those doors closed? I'm not sure why. Um, then your worship, I can address one mm -hmm. sure, So mm -hmm. with the farmer's market, yeah, we did reevaluate it this year mm -hmm. and that most likely will change in the new year or in the winter season this year, okay. they'll be entering through the front door. Mm -hmm. um, the setup didn't quite work out during mm -hmm. certain removal times and logistically, um, Setting up the market it works better that way, but for patrons, we can see that it's just not working out the way 
we had envisioned and um, it worked well during COVID when we had no choice but to structure it that way. But we can definitely move towards um, bringing it back to the original way. And then in regards to the side doors, so the side doors are open from 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday, and then closed during the evenings and the weekends. And that's a shift that we have been discussing for years to make that shift. It has nothing to do with COVID. It is strictly from just a security perspective. In the evenings, the front desk is usually staffed with one person. And it's really difficult to see who's coming in when you have multiple entrances that are accessible to the public. And, and typically in large facilities like that, there's one point of entrance. And with us having two points of entrance, we were often finding that there was um, individuals sneaking into the fitness room or just sneaking into that back hallway and just getting into a bit of trouble. And there was just that security issue of staff not feeling safe, not knowing who was in the building, not being able to see who was coming in the building. So we made the decision to keep that access closed during the evenings, but open during the office hours when there was multiple staff in the building and not so much of a risk. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Mr. Nano? Seeing none, thank you, appreciate your report. I'm just going to make an announcement before I call to go in camera. So we are going to go in camera here momentarily. Um, I'm not sure if Councillor Cherry has fallen off or not. It looks like he has. Um, but when we come back after, so some people are on now wanting to see the special council meeting. There is another link to get people to the special council meeting. Um, so we'll do the in camera, we'll come back and there'll be another link for those online to uh, to access that uh, special meeting. So uh, Councillor Cherry, I don't know whether you heard all of that, but definitely we'll be here on this uh, for the in camera. And then there'll be another link to go to to come back to the special council meeting. So you, you hear that? I got you. Thanks, Your Worship. All right. All right, so I'm going to call for a motion to go in camera pursuant to section 90.1 D and E of the community charter. Someone want to make that motion for me? Councilor Stapeners, Councilor Orlando, all in favor? Motions carried. We're going to be going in camera momentarily. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break uh, just for watching. All right.